Good morning. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For those of you who are linking with us now on Facebook, we are here to lift up and exalt the name of Jesus. The song says, How Great Is Our God. If you know He's great this morning, give Him praise. How Great Is Our God. We greet you in the only name that matters on behalf of our First Lady our deacons, our ministers, our entire Macedonia church family. Thank you for coming over to Macedonia and helping us. We are here to praise the name of the Lord. We certainly thank God for our very own Vernetta Bentley Brown, who's going to sing for us this morning. She's our soloist. She's going to take us higher as our psalmist on today. And afterwards, I'm coming back with this morning's sermon found in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 from the New International Version. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. God is real. 
know God is real. I think I should have gotten a better response than that. How many of you know God is real? I'm not talking about what you heard, but how many of you know God is real? Real in my soul. Thank you, Vernetta. I'm grateful how she incorporated the story of her mother and her having been so sick. Then she came back and told you about the turnaround because her mother is in the house this morning and we are certainly grateful. Yes, God is real. He's real in my soul. From Mark's gospel, I need to leave that alone. When you've experienced him for yourself, then you can tell somebody I know God is real. When you were down and he picked you up, you can tell somebody, I know God, when all doors were closed and he made a way out of nowhere. It's your testimony. Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 2, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, God is real. Real in my soul. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, God is real. Yes, sir. Real in my soul. Bless your name, God. Some folk may doubt and some folk may scorn. All can desert and leave him alone. But as for me, I'll take God's part. God is real. Real, real, down in my soul. Yes. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, from the New International Version. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, 
carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. I want to talk from a subject this morning that is a question. Who, who's got your back? Who's got your back? God, we thank you for this privilege to stand and rightfully divide your word of truth. God, my soul is still ignited because I know this morning that you are real. Now, God, I pray that you'd allow me to focus Allow me to exalt your name. Grant me clarity of speech. Use me for your glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And amen. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. Tony Dungy, the first African American coach to win a Super Bowl, said in his book, The Soul of a Team, a modern day fable for winning teamwork. Said, I have seen some pretty crazy stuff. Yes, that's the way he said it. Pretty crazy stuff. Tantrums, arrest, locker room fights, leaks to reporters about personnel issues. You name it, I've seen it. He said, I've also seen a lot of great things, selfless acts of courage and compassion moments of kindness and humility and people living with faith and integrity making a genuine difference in the world. John Maxwell, who I had the pleasure of meeting our group the last trip to Israel, um, authored the book, The 17 Indisputable Laws of Teamwork said, to win in sports, members of the team must always keep the big picture in front of them. They must remember that the goal is more important than the role or any given glory they may desire. It's all about the team. Dave Sutherland, stay with me, CEO of the Enjoy Group, said the team must size up the situation and come up with the plan to accomplish the vision. He said, some people see the size of the goal and they get scared. Retired General Colin Powell said, the best method of overcoming obstacles is the team method. All four, stay with me, Dungey, Maxwell, Sutherland, and Powell capture the true essence of teamwork. Dungey's selfless acts of courage and compassion moved me. Maxwell's members of the team must always keep the big picture in front of them also moved me. I was captured by Sutherland's statement, some people see the size of the goal and they get scared. But then Colin Powell knocked the ball out of the park with his teamwork mindset and the ability to overcome all obstacles by working together. The question is, who's got your back? We see all of this in our text a complete reversal of what Sutherland said in the text this morning. And while others, according to Colin Powell, understand that by working together, we can overcome all obstacles. Just curious, who's on your team? Our text takes place in Capernaum. And this morning, the historical context is quite important because it allows us to see the popularity of Jesus. Mark says a few days later, Again, Jesus entered into Capernaum. That word again captures the pretext because remember, Jesus had been to Capernaum in Mark chapter 1. The sermon this morning is from Mark chapter 2. Now, somebody's asking, well, why are you sharing that? Mark chapter 1, we see that Jesus enters into Capernaum where he taught in the temple. And the Bible says he taught as one having authority. Brenda, the Bible says, while there, Jesus encountered a man who was possessed with an unclean spirit. The unclean spirits, I said spirits, plural, spoke to Jesus and asked, what do you want with us? 
Jesus, thou son of Nazareth. Brenda, this helps us to understand that the unclean spirits understood the authority that Jesus has. And also they knew him. Stay with me. The Bible says that Jesus rebuked the unclean spirits, demanded them to come out of the man. And the Bible says when the people saw this, they were amazed. Stay with me. At the end of chapter 1, Jesus ran into a leper. And the leper asked Jesus, if you're willing, would you make me clean? The Bible says Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Jesus touched a leper, an unclean leper, and he was cleansed. Jesus told the leper not to tell anyone. Now, come on now. Jesus touched the leper, spoke to the leper, and said, be thou clean. And then Jesus told the leper not to tell anyone. It's just like somebody who's just been healed of some sickness. And then you tell them, keep it quiet. There are some things you can't keep quiet. The man went out and told everybody. So now, Jesus' popularity was spread aboard. He had exercised authority over a demonic spirit or the demonic spirits. And he had just touched and healed a man who was sick with leprosy. And now everybody was talking about Jesus. Everybody wanted to meet this man who had the power to speak to demonic spirits and who had the power to touch lepers and speak to the leper and say, be thou clean. So Mark builds the case and he does an outstanding job with it. First of all, to let you know in chapter one that Jesus is the person that everyone wants to meet, everyone wants to see because they had never seen or met a man that could do the things that Jesus had done. And now in chapter two, Mark tells us, stay with me, that Jesus came back to Capernaum. Are y'all with me? When we go to Israel, I'm always captured by the ruins of that little house where they say this took place when we enter into the city of Capernaum. Well, inside of that house, Jesus made a return visit. But this time, Deacon Jenkins, there were so many people who were trying to get to Jesus. Are y'all with me? The Bible says that they could not even go through a door. They couldn't get in the window because the place was filled with individuals who desired to see this man, come on somebody, who had just healed a man with leprosy, who desired to see this man who had power over evil spirits. And everybody was hoping that some way, somehow, those who were on scene would also witness another miracle. Are y'all with me? Everyone wanted to see Jesus. Everyone wanted to be in his presence. And the Bible says Jesus entered into Capernaum and now he's on the inside of the house and Mark says he's not just there to showcase himself but he's there, he's preaching the word. Wow. And then all of a sudden we hear of a paralytic who's cared by four. A paralytic who has four friends that are concerned about his welfare. A paralytic who had four men who cared enough about him to sacrifice their time, to sacrifice their energy. Are y'all with me? To do something that no one else had done for this man. They had heard about Jesus. Talk to me, somebody. And they wanted to get their friend, this paralytic. Are y'all with me? into the presence of Jesus. Now, you don't make that trip unless you believe that once I get him there, something's going to happen. Today is going to be the first day of the rest of his life. They believe that if they could just get him into the presence of Jesus, things would change. Brothers and sisters, I've listened to preachers for quite some time, and, and, and many of us, Terry Henry included, have always, uh, Reverend Lord, focused on the paralytic. Are y'all with me? And as the Lord led me to not just focus on the paralytic, but focus on the four men. The four men who cared enough about this brother to get him into the presence of Jesus. I wish I had somebody to help me. I want to look at their concern mm, for this brother. All right, that's my first point. I'm going to get to there in just a minute. Not only why I don't want to look at their concern for this brother, but I want to look at their creativity mm, for this brother. And finally, I want to look at their faith. 
their concern, their creativity, and their faith. Are y'all with me? These four men were genuinely concerned about the paralytic. Mark does not tell us who heard about Jesus, whether it was the paralytic himself or the four friends. But nevertheless, I want you to imagine them going by the paralytic's home, come on somebody, placing him on the mat and carrying him for a distance into Capernaum. Now, we do not know how heavy the man was, but it didn't matter because they were concerned, come on somebody, about getting him into the presence of Jesus. Are you with me? Think about the brainstorming. Thinking about their determination. Thinking about making the journey and possibly saying, wow, we've come this far. We've got a, a long way to go, but yet they were determined to get him into the presence of Jesus. But when they arrived at the house of Reverend Bell, they faced some obstacles. And brothers and sisters, let me share with you that if the first obstacle moves you or makes you turn around, then you need to check your relationships. Y'all didn't hear that. If the first obstacle makes your friends turn their back on you, then you need to check your relationships. These men were determined because they were concerned about someone else. Pastor Henry, we live in a world now, oh, y'all are quiet in here this morning. We live in a world now where it's all about me. It's all about selfies. Are y'all with me? It's all about taking a picture of myself. You don't see any folk pitching, uh, uh, posting pictures of somebody else. I wish I had somebody to talk to me. We live in a world now where it's all about me, myself, and I. But this text helps us to understand that the Lord wants us to be concerned about others just like we are concerned about ourselves. <laughs> Pastor Henry, you mean to tell me I got a bit out of the bed early this morning to hear this? Somebody apparently did some brainstorming. Somebody was thinking, collaborating along the way, trying to find out a way of what they were going to do once they arrived. Are y'all with me? Before I move any further, I just got a question I got to ask, and that is, do you have any associates, friends, cousins, family members, or partners would sacrifice their time and energy to get you into the presence of Jesus? Do you have four friends, four associates, four partners, four family members who will sacrifice their time to do something to help you instead of doing something to help or promote themselves? They're concerned. Oftentimes, are y'all with me? We tend to think again about the paralytic, but I want to focus again on the four men, four concerned brothers who were willing to put aside their own agenda. In 2021, folk who are willing to say, look, this is not about me, but this is about helping somebody else. This is about putting someone else's needs and concerns in front of mine. Oh, I saw about three hands. I, I, I guess this is something y'all don't want to hear. But, but, but the story is in the book of Acts and it's there for a reason. And it's also in the book of Matthew. And it's in the book of Mark from which I'm preaching this morning. Concern. Their friend needed Jesus. Their friend needed healing. Are y'all with me? And these men were not disciples. Well, Pastor Andrew, why do you say that? Because if you remember, Perry, initially in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus called his disciples, he said to each and everyone, if you desire to follow me, first of all, he called for self-denial. Self-denial. Are you with me? That's what Tony Junja talked about when he said selfless acts, self-denial. Are you with self-denial? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. They didn't say maybe another day. They didn't say I've got something to do today. Perhaps we'll take him on Friday. They didn't say I have something on my agenda. Check back with me another day. They thought about the brother, and they thought less about themselves. Pastor Henry, where are you going? I'm, I'm glad you asked, all right? Think in mind, Dr. Oaks, that they set their own issues aside. Come on, let's be honest, all of us have problems. All of us have issues. All of us have things that are at the forefront of my mind. But how many days of the week do you think of others more so than you think of yourself? 
oh, I saw one hand on the front. Thank you, Brenda, who's doing this. But, but, but let, let me share this with you, and I think you'll get it when I do this. Dr. Martin Luther King preached one of the greatest sermons, and I've read it whew, uh, umpteen times through the years on November the 20th, 1955, 10 years before I was born. It was a sermon that's posted everywhere, and I have several of his books, but uh, it's considered to be one of his top sermons. And Dr. King preached this when he became pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Atlanta. Dr. King preached about the Good Samaritan. Stay with me, Deacon Jenkins. Uh, you know the story. The Good Samaritan uh, is a story of a Samaritan, a stranger, helping a Jewish man who had been beaten and left to die on the Jericho Road. Dr. King says, listen, and I quote, the cure for these social ills are still with us today would be to identify with the wounded man. Whoa, it's quiet. I do not mean to have mere pity for what he symbolizes, but to actually see oneself as vulnerable as he. Now, some of y'all say, well, Pastor Henry, we know he was a great orator. Break it down to what Dr. King was saying. Dr. King says, you'll never understand the story of the Good Samaritan until you see yourself as the one who was beaten and left beside the road to die. Pastor Henry, where you going? You'll never understand this story of the full men and the paralytic until you see yourself as the paralytic. Now, I know some of y'all think you're at the top of the world. You're playing your A game, and you've got it going on. And you are saying in your mind, I'll never be in that predicament. Well, if there's anything that COVID has taught us, never say never. Talk to me, somebody. And who knows what tomorrow, ah, I wish I had somebody to help me, is going to bring. I want to tell somebody, you may be up today. But you can be down this afternoon. Talk to me, somebody. And you very well could be the one who is in need of help. Dr. King said it's not until you see yourself as the one who needs help. Ah, oh, now y'all are waking up to realize the message of this story. Wow. Some of us act like we will always be on the top. But anything could happen today that turns your world upside down. How many of you believe that anything could happen today? So the question is, Mike, here it is. What would I want others to do for me if I was the paralytic? Now, some of y'all are saying, well, thank God I'm not paralyzed. Mm. Some folk are not paralyzed <laughs> the way that the paralytic in the text was paralyzed. But we are suffering from different kinds of paralysis. Help me somebody. Talk to me somebody. Can't get up. Paralyzed in the mind. Paralyzed spiritually. Uh-oh. I'll look at the message on Facebook this afternoon. I guess I won't see many likes today. Are you a preaching pastor? The four men were altruistic to the core. That word altruism is a regard or devotion to, for others. Whoa. It's placing my needs aside and thinking about someone else. It's focusing on others more so than I'm focusing on myself. Again, the challenge is to get the paralytic into the presence of Jesus. But they were facing, look, a massive crowd. They couldn't get through the door. And in this context, the crowd was the roadblock. The crowd was the hindrance, Antron. So the Bible says, since they could not get to Jesus, I'm reading the text, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof. Now we move from their concern to their creativity. Pastor Henry, who in the world would have ever thought of tearing off the roof to get a man in front of Jesus? I'm going to preach in a minute. Commentary said during this time, particularly in Palestinian homes and, and Jewish homes as well, rooftops were flat. Are y'all with me? They were pitched with different layers. Help me somebody. 
I, and in addition, all of their homes would have had a, a stairway up the side of the house. Because if you ever need to pass the roof, then you go on top and do whatever you need to do to rectify the situation. So they had access, are y'all with me, to the roof. But I want you to think about it for a moment, trying to maneuver a paralytic on a mat up to the rooftop. Somebody could have said, man, this is too much. This is overwhelming. Let's turn around and go back home. He's been paralyzed pretty much all his life. It's not going to hurt for him to be paralyzed one day longer. That's a poor attitude. And let me ask you this. If it had been you, would you have wanted to someone to push? To push? To hold? To get you up to the top? And then place him on the roof. And then there are some layers mm, that have to be removed. So that means the task is what? Laborious. That means that uh, uh, it's an arduous task. We got to remove some layers because guess what? We got a brother that's on top of the roof and we need to get him into the presence of Jesus. Help me somebody. There's no time to quit. There's no time to go back home. We are more concerned about him than we are concerned about our brothers. Or ourselves. Pastor. Whoa. I was looking for more than this this morning. Roofs. Removing the layers of the roof. And I want to throw in something that many of you may not know. This was somebody else's house. That changes the dynamics of the situation. Because now I'm tearing off somebody else's roof. Uh-oh, uh-oh. But then they faced another challenge, and that is to get the man down. Tommy, that means somehow or another you've got to have some ropes, and you've got to be able to get him down. Now, somebody also had to do some peeping because they didn't want him to fall in the kitchen. They didn't want to lower him down in the bathroom. They wanted to lower him down right in front of Jesus. Talk to me, somebody. Pastor Henry, you mean to tell me that they were that creative? Ingenuity at its best. Now, for some of y'all sitting, Pastor, I've never heard of such. Then I want to remind those of you who went with me, and us rather, as we took our bus to the first inauguration of President Obama, January 20th, 2009. I'll never forget that day. It was 18 degrees in Washington, D.C. It was the coldest I think I'd ever been in my lifetime. Some of y'all raise your hands if you were with us on that trip. And we went and we stood in a massive crowd. Deacon Jenkins, what you may not know is there were so many people there that you couldn't move one inch. And when I said Deacon Nicholson, I'll tell you not one inch. Brother Charles Brown and I stood beside each other. And we were wondering, Lord, what in the world are we going to do? How can we get out of this crowd? A uh, lady from Chicago was in front of me, and somebody from Michigan was to my left. And you, I'm telling you, you couldn't move. And then all of a sudden, we heard some noise in the background. A man up front became ill. I don't know whether y'all remember that or not. And everybody was trying to figure out how they were going to get this ill man through the crowd, and back so they could get him some medical attention. Are y'all with me? Brother Brown, Charles Brown, I remember and I stood there and I said, oh my God. I said, they'll never get him through this crowd. Then all of a sudden, I noticed something. Something that I've never seen before. Some brothers had picked the man up and they were passing him along like they were passing cargo. I wish I had somebody to help me. Now, you got to imagine that, and I guess y'all are saying, Pastor Henry, how in the world could one person hold the man up? You don't have to worry about holding him when you're doing teamwork. All they were doing was just passing him along. One person touched his legs, another person touched his shoulders, and they kept him moving, moving until they got him to the back. Ingenuity. Collaboration. Creativity, concern. Maybe they thought to themselves, what would someone do if this was me? You see, brothers and sisters, it changes. I'm going to preach in a minute. 
when you consider yourself. When you consider that it could have been you. Talk to me somebody. That it could have been you. Are y'all with me? They got the man out. They got the medical assistance that he needed. Are y'all with me? Now, brothers and sisters, the Bible says in verse 5, after all of the removal of the layers, get ready, Antoine, I'm going to close in a minute. Now, you've got to understand that if these layers were being removed, that means there has to be some noise inside of the house. That means that somebody, Reverend Brown, had to hear that somebody was tearing off the roof. And you got to understand that they were removing layers on top. Something in the ceiling had to be falling down. Y'all ought to help me in here. If something in the ceiling is falling down, that means that somebody realizes that there's some activity going on. Talk to me, somebody. And the Bible says in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, y'all didn't get me. Now Mark does a great job of telling us that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now Mark takes us on a theological quest. <laughs> now I said that because you got to get this. And don't let me lose you in trying to exegete the passage because it's important. Notice Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, you got to get that, Sister Johnson, because here's the key. The Jews believe that if you were sick that, and, and, and you had done something or sinned in the past, that your sickness was a result of your sin. So Jesus knew that in order to heal the man, you had to first deal with the sin problem. Uh-oh. Now, here's the part. Genevieve, you need to tell the ushers because open the doors because somebody's going to walk out. But I'm all right. <laughs> if the Lord's all right, I'm all right. Because when Jesus said your sons are, sins are forgiven, all of a sudden the religious folk, the church, ah, oh, y'all don't hear me, began to murmur. They didn't have the courage to say it out loud. But they began to whisper under their breath. Who is this man who forgives sins? Oh, I feel my help now. Who is this man that can tell somebody your sins are forgiven? Now, I have to be honest with you. In all my years of preaching, Reverend Lord, I had never noticed this verse. Are y'all with me? That Jesus did something. The Bible says that immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Brenda, he didn't address what they said, but he addressed what they were thinking. Y'all will get that when you get home. He didn't address what they said, but he addressed what they were thinking. He didn't address what they said, but he told them what they're thinking. He said, which would be easier for me to tell a man that his sins have been forgiven or to take up his bed and walk? Can I get a witness? Now, we can understand that he faced the crowd. Uh, that was the first obstacle. He faced the door. That was the second obstacle. He faced the roof. That was the third obstacle. But no one would have ever imagined that church folk would have been the first, fourth obstacle. Oh, I can tell somebody don't like this. That is the religious folk who should have been saying, can we help you? Rather was trying to find an excuse to keep a brother down. I wish I had somebody help me. Nobody in the crowd asked, can we help? <laughs> Instead, they looked at, they looked at the fact that Jesus was forgiving sins. Can I get a witness? But then the text says, are y'all with me? That after Jesus said that, I want to back up and share what Mark shared. I've talked about their concern. I've talked about, are y'all with me? Their creativity. And finally, their faith. Because the Bible says in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith. Can I get a witness? Brethren, if you guys will take this to that measure of tearing off a rooftop. 
just to get into my presence that I've got something that I've got to do to reward your faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the four men who were concerned and creative about a brother who was suffering from what? Paralysis. Pastor, get him in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, are you closing, preacher? Not yet. When Jesus saw their faith, preacher, you're closing? Not yet. When Jesus saw their faith, preacher, are you closing? Not yet. When Jesus saw their faith, Perry, when Jesus saw their action, faith requires action. James says, if you want to show me faith, show me your action. Now, Jesus did something to disturb the crowd. I'm going to close now. The Bible says that Jesus said to the man, look, get up. Now, it's interesting that he didn't ask the four brothers to help him up. Get up. Take up your mat. You get up. You take up your mat. Talk to me, somebody, because even though they brought you here, you've got to have enough faith to do what I'm telling you to do. You've got to have enough faith to believe that I've got the power to speak to. I wish I had somebody to help me to muscles that haven't moved. You've got to understand the measure of my strength. Get up, take up your bed and walk. Y'all don't hear me. That's verse nine. Well, I have to admit, I, I missed verse 10. Because in verse 10, he comes right back and says, look, get up, take up your mat, and go home. <laughs> Y'all didn't get it. Verse 9, get up, take up your mat, and walk. Verse 10, take up your mat, walk, and go home. Because see, when you left home, you were carried by four brothers. But now when you go back home, you're walking your own front door. I wish I had somebody to know that I thank God we serve a God who can turn things around. Left home carried by four. Went home, walked in his own house. Left home carried by four. Went home, walked in his own house. Left home carried by four. Went home and walked in his own house. Pastor, how you gonna close? And the Bible says, and when the crowd saw this, they glorified God and said, we've never seen anything like this. Can I get somebody to help me? We've never seen anything like this. Perry, I thought about how to close. And I kept tossing some ideas around. Wanted to go back to Tuna Dungeon. Thought about recapturing Sutherland's statement. Of course, I could always end with some quote from Dr. King. But then I thought about myself and the four men and others who helped get me into the presence of Jesus. So rather than trying to find out who has my back, I want to go back and thank God for those who've had my back, who brought me into the presence of Jesus. I wish I had about five folk that would give God glory for those who helped you along the way, somebody who sacrificed, somebody who did something creative, somebody who blessed you along the way. I wish I had somebody that would give God glory for folk who assisted you along the way. I could call some names, but when folk listen to the clip, they say, well, you left me out. So I'll just say to God be the glory. But while I'm thinking of others, there's somebody else that I have to mention. And if I mention his name, I won't have to worry about anybody being jealous about what I said about somebody else. And that is the man who got me off of the mat. I'm talking about Jesus. When I was down on my luck, when I was down on my back, is there anybody in the house know that I called on the name of Jesus? And he said, Terry, Take up your bed, 
Walk, Terry, take up your mat and walk, Terry, take up your mat and go home and tell somebody about what the Lord has done for you. All I've got to say is I'm grateful for all that God has done. I'm grateful he didn't leave me on the mat. I'm grateful that he came along and cared enough about me that he picked me up when I was down. So all I can say is thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord has been mighty good to me. And I want to thank him for not leaving me. Where he found me, I want to thank him for not leaving me. Down in the dumps, I want to thank him for picking me up when I was down. I want to thank him for showing me that when no one else cares, I am the one who cares. I, I, you know, I'm not trying to get into your business, but I'm going to ask, do you have four friends? Uh, four family members, four associates, four partners, four co-workers. Do you have anybody who cares enough about you to pick you up when you can't carry yourself and get you into the presence of Jesus? Wow. Four friends who are willing to deny themselves. Four friends who are willing to put their agendas to the side. Four friends who are creative enough to recapture the essence that Tony Dungey said of teamwork, selfless acts, where nobody gets the credit. Jenkins, Jenkins, when you think about it, a mat has four corners, and each brother had to grab a corner. So all the Lord is saying, if you just hold up your corner, I had thought about using this subject, and you'll get it when you get home. A paralytic with eight feet. Two on this corner. Two on that corner. Two on this corner. And two on this corner. And it matters not that you can't walk. All we want to do is get you in the presence of Jesus. And when we get you there, you'll be able to leave and go home on your own two feet. We've got to get you there. As we stand all over the house, and those of you who listen to Facebook that haven't shut it down because this was not what you wanted to hear, I want you to do an assessment of your so-called friends. Do you have four people who are concerned about you? Do you have four people who are creative enough to do something extraordinary to get you into the presence of Jesus. Do you have four friends who will show Jesus their faith on your behalf? You know, Deacon Jackson, we live in an era now where everybody's taking and making videos. You better mind what you do because somebody's got their phone recording. If this had happened in 2021, you would have seen somebody holding up their phone recording this episode. Can I tell you what they saw? They saw four men <laughs> bringing a paralytic to Jesus. They saw four men tearing off a rooftop. They saw four men lowering Jesus down, lowering the paralytic into the presence of Jesus. They saw Jesus respond and said, look at their faith. And they saw Jesus say to a man who was suffering from paralysis, get up, take up your bed and walk. And after you take it up, go home. Wow, can you imagine seeing that on Instagram? Can you imagine seeing that Jimmy on Facebook? And then the Bible says, it closes, I got to close. That they say, we have never seen anything like this. I want to ask one final time. Do you have four friends? Four acquaintances, four neighbors, four cousins, 
for family members, for co-workers, for partners who care enough about you to deny themselves to get you into the presence of Jesus. The reward was great. Jesus talked about their faith. If you are unsaved today and have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I invite you to come. I invite you to come. If you need somebody to hold you up, I know somebody that will hold all four corners. And his name is Jesus. He'll pick you up when you're down and he'll carry you when you can't carry yourself. If you want to know what moves him, what excites him, I'll tell you what moves him and excites him. That is faith. Faith excites him. Action excites him. Movement excites him. The doors of the church are open. Deacon Jenkins and Deacon Jackson are standing. If you have decided to unite with Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church, Ministers Incorporated, we invite you to come. You may come by letter, a candidate for baptism, or you may come on Christian experience. I want you to remember there's a strong possibility this brother would have never received his healing if he hadn't had four friends who were concerned who were creative and who had faith. It's prayer time. Reverend Boston, would you make your way around and you have to cross, keep from crossing in front of the camera and come and let us look to God. Now I'm gonna take it a, a step further and go down deeper. All of us know at least one person that's still on the mat. Mm. Mm. All of us, Vanetta, know at least one person that's still on the mat. Somebody's tried to get up, but they can't get up by themselves. And I'm going to draw it closer. All of us got at least one family member that's still on the mat. Paralyzed with fear. Paralyzed in a state of hopelessness in this pandemic, paralyzed, lost touch. Pray with them, pray for them. As Reverend Boston leads us to the throne of grace. While we're praying, Deacon Ron Jenkins messaged me this morning concerning his mother and asked for prayers for her. Let us remember his mother and Deacon S. Jenkins' mother-in-law in prayer as well. I called out several names earlier. Somebody else is on the mat. Somebody's on the mat this morning at New Hanover Hospital. Someone's trying to breathe. Somebody's on the mat. And I want to say again, don't you take for granted that because you're up, you won't be on the mat this afternoon. So for just being here, somebody ought to give God your highest praise. Hallelujah. I thank God for my four friends. But I thank God most of all for Jesus who got me off of the mat. Bless your name, God. Pray with me. Bless your name, God. Oh, God, we thank you this day, God. We thank you for another opportunity just to say thank you. God, Pastor Henry asked the question. He asked, who's got your back? Lord, we know that somebody out there feels like no one has their back. But I want to encourage you that God has your back that he promised never to leave you nor forsake you, that he'll be with you through all manner of trouble. 
who's got your back? God, we thank you for friends that we don't even know who are praying for us. God, we thank you for every Pray prayer. Around Boston. We thank you for every concern. God, even for others who don't even know what to pray for, God, give us the wisdom, God. Give us ideas and creativity as to how to reach a dying world. Oh God, I'm a witness because I was that paralytic, God, who stood back, hallelujah, didn't think I had a friend in the world, but God, you sent more than four, hallelujah, to cry on my behalf. I'll say your prayer. Oh, thank you, God. I thank you, God, because when I didn't want to be reached, somebody reached out their hand. The phone rang and I didn't want to answer, God. Someone knocked on the door, I didn't want to open it. But God, I thank you for friends, hallelujah, that will never let you down. God, I thank you that they'll come and see about you. Thank you, God. Oh, hallelujah, we thank you, God, for your saving grace. We thank you, God, for, for your awesome power, God. We thank you for your healing power, God. There are so many that are sick. Hallelujah. There are so many that are heartbroken. God, right now, we pray, God, that you give peace to those families who, are, who have lost a loved one, God. God, we ask you to speak peace to those who are lying on the hospital beds, God. Comfort them, God. Hold them, Lord Jesus. God, we realize you don't make a mistake, but God. But Lord Jesus, sometimes it's really hard to understand, God. But God, but because we trust you, God, we realize, God, that all things do work together for the good, God. You're going to get the glory out of everything, God. This is your will, God. But God, we also know that we have a job to do, God. We have to seek oh, yes. your face, God. We have to turn from our wicked ways, God. God, God, please forgive us for all of our sins, God. Clean us up, God, and make us worthy, God, to serve you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you, God. God, we thank you for friends. Oh, God, we thank you for Jesus, who thought it not robbery to lay down his life. Oh, yes. To save a sinner like me and you and you and you. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. When there are no more prayers to be prayed, no more songs to be sung, God, we look for you to come back for your church without spot or wrinkle, God. Help us to be ready, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Reverend Boston. For those of you that are watching via Facebook, let's be reminded that some men came and brought a paralyzed man to Jesus. When they could not get in because of the crowd, they took him up to the top of the roof, tore the roof off, and allowed him to be positioned right in front of Jesus. I want to close by, uh, rather in the live feed, by asking you a question. Who among your friends will take the time to do something to help you, to help others, who will commit a selfless act, according to Tony Dungy, and practice teamwork? That's what it's all about. In this season where people are dying left and right, in this season of sickness and despair, let's not think of ourselves, but let's think of others. What can I do that will help a neighbor to help somebody else get back on their feet? God bless you and have a wonderful day in the Lord. We'll continue our worship here. Amen and amen.